Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Like Dr. Theokratov, I'm not particularly a comparativist scholar, so I'm going to stick with things on the Christian side and then hopefully have some engagement from other speakers ordering questions and answers. My paper for today's conference is actually a paper I wrote back when I was doing a master's in theological studies at Emory, and it focuses on an issue of biblical interpretation. There's a seminal verse in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis where God gives Adam and Eve dominion, quote, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth, end quote. That text certainly presents some questions for environmentalism and for the meaning of uh, responsibility toward creation on the part of human beings. There are some folks who see it as authorizing humans to exploit the environment. Uh, that's true on both the Christian side of things and on folks who are critical of Christian contributions to harm to the environment. But I think as a matter of textualism, that's not quite the right interpretation. Dominion is linked in the first chapter of Genesis to humans being the bearers of the divine image. This passage is meant to connect to a broader vision of theological anthropology, what it means to be a human being in relationship fundamentally to God. That means that we have to look at both theology and anthropology in order to fully understand the verse. First, we have to look at theology. What does dominion mean in terms of God? And then we should look at anthropology. What should dominion mean in terms of the human being? So what my paper looks at is how God exercises dominion over two different kinds of things. First, over creation in general, and then secondly, over human beings in particular. The Bible's account and I know it's easy to oversimplify any one account from the Bible, but over and over again throughout the Hebrew Bible and throughout the New Testament, God's dominion over creation is not one of rank exploitation, is not one of reducing that things down to resources to be used for ulterior motives. Rather, God's dominion is a condition for the flourishing of creation. By being apart from creation, but lovingly creating it, God allows nature to have its own being, its own breathing room, its own existence in a way that is still cradled and held, embraced and loved by the spirit of God. But a being that can stand um, to an extent on its own as well, one that has its own gifted value from God. Nature, in turn, throughout the Christian and Jewish scriptures is described as rejoicing under God's dominion, that God makes things grow, that he makes his creatures delight, that he feeds them, that they have life when he sends forth his spirit, that creation benefits from being within God's dominion. It's not that God's dominion is exclusive it's not that there's some trade-off between God having dominion and creation doing well and doing what it's capable and supposed to do. In addition, eschatology, or concerns about the end things, are sometimes debated in environmental contexts as well. There's an argument that Christianity, by suggesting that, look, this world is coming to an end as we know it, should somehow lessen our sense of responsibility for creation in the present age. But the book of Revelation and a number of the Jewish prophecies around the end times talk not about heaven as some sort of ethereal plane, an immaterial existence where everything else is gone and there's just abstract souls. Rather, the scriptures talk about a new heaven and a new earth, where the relationship between God, creation, and human beings is restored, is brought back to life in ways that cause all of creation to flourish together, 
Think about the prophet Isaiah talking about the lion laying down with the lamb. Heaven seen in that way is not a bunch of clouds, but rather, as the book of Revelation puts it, it's a city. It's a place with a running river, a place where trees grow, a place where creation flourishes and is restored. So even that end vision of what God's eternal dominion looks like does not exist in contradiction to creation flourishing in its own ways as well. Rather, creation's flourishing is part of God's plan, is part of how God exercises dominion. It is perhaps a little bit less controversial or uh, easier to see, maybe would be a better way to put it, that that's how God's dominion exercised over human beings as well. Human beings are not just divine playthings. They're not meant to be fodder for some sort of divine vision that excludes their good. Rather, God's dominion over human beings is meant for their own good life. Uh, to turn to a thinker common to both Dr. Theocritus' Orthodox tradition and my own Catholic one, you know, St. Athanasius describes the glory of God as a fully as a human being fully alive. There's a way in which that's true of all of God's creatures, that God's dominion, God's glory is shown through things um, being fully themselves. Turning to the anthropology side of the coin, uh, scripture describes human beings as being created to be stewards of nature, to till and order the good earth, to live in its midst, to bring forth its fruit, to help it to flourish, to bear God's image as that good gardener, as that good steward. And in fact, that's not just a matter of positive divine command. It's also a necessity of human nature. The way that human beings are made is human beings are vulnerable. We need creation to flourish in order for our own flourishing to happen. And that's something that humanity has come to realize more over the past century and a half as industrialism has upset further some of the balances between human beings and creation. We're aware now in ways that we didn't used to be that using consumer products can affect the climate and that can leave us exposed to more cancer or the things that go into water can affect plant and insect life far downstream in ways that can have an impact on our agriculture and on our ability to sustain our communities and our own health and our own lives. What is more though, it's not just a matter of bare necessity, human flourishing, even seen from a human perspective, actually requires respecting creation and living in a harmonious way with it. I talk in my paper about Josef Pieper, the post-war German Catholic philosopher, who talks about how to be human, to have a human spirit, means the ability to relate to creation beyond just immediate needs. He describes how animals have the ability, sometimes in very ingenious ways, to relate to other things in order to reproduce, in order to find shelter in order to evade predators, in order to get food. Human beings alone, though, can relate to things in an abstract, in a spiritual, in a transcendent way. And therefore, he says, human beings actually have a world, not just other things that they can exploit, but rather an entire world that we inhabit. The insect expert E.O. Wilson, Harvard biologist, coming at this from a secular angle, talked about the human tendency toward biophilia or a love of other things that live. And even though he wasn't religious himself, he talked about the sense of human fulfillment that comes from living in the midst of other creatures and being together with them. So seeing that bigger picture of theological anthropology is important context for understanding that verse in the first chapter of the book of Genesis conferring dominion. If dominion is God's gift and mandate to humanity, and if it is part of how we bear the image of God in the midst of creation, then it's meant to be something that supports mutual flourishing. 
not something that authorizes us to be abusers of creation. So I hope to be a good steward of this morning's time. So I'm going to turn things over for questions there. But uh, it's, again, been a pleasure to be able to be a part of this conversation as um, somebody who's doing a little bit more formal lawyerly discourse now and a little bit less of the theology side of things. This has been really refreshing for me and uh, has helped to make my spirit flourish as well and hopefully has contributed something to you all as well. So thank you.